Turn from the light. Your breast bare. Look into the dark. There are some paintings that impress one with a conviction that they represent not merely the imagined shapes and characters conceived in the mind of the artist, but scenes or faces or situations that have actually existed. There is in one strange picture that intangible something which stamps it as just such a representation of reality. It's a remarkable work by the Dutch painter Schalken. He was a pupil of Gerrit Dow, who had been in his turn a student under Rembrandt van Rijn. Schalken worked in the city of Leiden in the 1670s, and this example of his work is in a remarkably good state of preservation. You see a chamber in what might be some antique religious building, the foreground occupied by a female figure in a white robe, in her hand a candle by which alone her figure and face are illuminated and her features wear such an arch smile, as well becomes a pretty woman when she's engaged in some charming trickery of her own device. In the background, the figure of a man, dressed in the old Flemish fashion, in an attitude of alarm, his hand placed on the hilt of his sword, which he seems to be in the act of drawing. The rest, total shadow, except that the dim light seems to define in the darkness some form. My great-grandfather knew the painter well, and from Schalken himself he learned the terrible story behind the picture. You will observe from the first the distinction between this painting, typical of the later work of Schalken, and the cool, measured and exactly balanced style of Flemish art for which he must have been prepared as a student under Gerrit Dow. And it is in his studio in Leiden in the year 1665 that our story begins. Gerrit Dow's exquisitely detailed and minutely executed paintings had justly earned him his great reputation. They had also all but destroyed his sight. From the age of 30, we know that he had gone progressively blind. the mantle of romance does hang a little ungracefully on the form of Gottfried Schalken. History records him in his later years as a boorish man of great ambition, foul temper and few manners. Eventually he was to fade into obscurity under the shadow of his more famous master. His education under Dow was traditionally formal and academic, but his later work, which I promise you will see and remember, seems to have its roots in some private world of dreams, perhaps never otherwise expressed.
the niece and ward of the wealthy Master Dow was not yet betrothed, although if tradition speaks truth, she had all the charm of the fair, light-skinned Flemish maidens. This was Rose Veldekast. Miss Veldekast, I... Still life, Roy. One hour begin. Of course, at this time, Godfrey Chalcombe was a poor student with no advantage of position or birth, nothing, in short, that could possibly induce Gerrit Dow to look favourably on any love match with his niece. The temptation of St. Anthony. St. Anthony, temptation, devils. You will imagine the devils. Begin.
Marvel, right? Belkast, I have no money, but I can work to a competence and a reputation. <clears throat> Miss Valdecast, I have to tell you that I've thought a little else but you. Forgive me, but I must know if if you could if you could come to if you also might in short. Gottfried Schalken was in love, as much as a Dutchman can be. Schalken, you may stay this evening. We dine at seven. I believe I know your intentions, Shulkin. I pride myself. I can well understand them. Next week, you shall begin to paint in oils. Your drawing is quite adequate. Thank you, Master Da. Good night to you, Shulkin.
Damn it. Damn the picture. Damn the devils. Damn the saints. Damn a lot of them to hell. Mm. Get it dull that my near Vanderhausen of Rotterdam desires to speak with him tomorrow evening at the same hour. And if it pleases him here in this house, may I say a matter what? of some weight, that is all. Did he say a portrait? He said only a matter of some weight. Mm. A portrait or one of those poor relations to be apprenticed. Well, there's no one in Rotterdam to leave me a legacy. He said at seven. Not by the clock at the Stadhouse, it had just struck seven when I saw him. Uh, Van der Gelt? Van der Housen. Oh, there's no one in Rotterdam to leave me any money. We'll have his worship presently, if he means to keep his hour. the honour to address my Herr Vanderhausen of Rotterdam. The same. I await the command of your lordship, which your lordship welcome. Is this a man of trust? Hmm? Well, most certainly, my pupil, Gottfried Schalken. Then let him take this box and ask a goldsmith to value its contents. You visited the town of Rotterdam four months ago. In the church of St. Lawrence, I saw your niece, Rose Veldekaust. I desire to marry her. When you are satisfied that I am wealthier than any husband you could imagine for her, you will close this proposal here and now. I wait for no calculation or delay. Well, sir, I, I do not doubt your position. However, you must be aware that the girl has a mind of her own. I mean, she may not agree to what we design for her, even something so much to her advantage. Do not seek to deceive me, painter. She is your property. She will become mine if you like to make her so. She has no choice. Well, you are a testy old gentleman, to be sure. But you may be as rich as you say. I'll not pledge myself unnecessarily, however. 
You will not pledge yourself unnecessarily, Gary Dow, but you will do so when you find it is necessary. When you are satisfied as to the value of my gold, you will here and now sign your name to this engagement. box was filled to the brim with gold coin of an antiquity and of a probable value that Shalkin could never have conceived in his wildest imaginings. Perfect. Not one grain of alloy. Perfect. Are you content to carry it down? I, I, I would have a day, sir. Not an hour. I am content. Then sign, for I am weary. Write his name in witness. I will visit you tomorrow night, Gary Dow, to see the object of our contract. Of course, Dow knew nothing of the attachment between Rose and his best pupil. Even if he had, it is doubtful whether he would have regarded it as any serious obstruction. Marriages were matters of traffic and calculation. The unfortunate girl was simply the object of a contract. 
supplies aren't what they used to be, Rose, but they're good enough to see. That pretty face of yours will make your fortune. No. <laughs> Believe me, girl, you'll soon be standing at the altar. Now, make the large room ready by seven o'clock. Tell Franz supper on the hour. I expect a friend. A very rich friend. So do you trick yourself out handsomely now. The painter, however, did not communicate to his niece the important step he had taken on her behalf, not that he anticipated opposition, but rather that, if she had made any inquiry about her destined bridegroom, Dow would have had to admit that he hadn't yet clearly seen his face. Welcome, mine hair. Welcome. I have the honour to present my niece, Rose Veldekhaust. You know my pupil, Gottfried Schalken. Mine hair, Vanderhausen of Rotterdam. <laughs> Please be seated. <laughs> we are most honoured. This is most, um... Yes. Rotterdam. Yes.
Oh, Uncle, what a terrible creature. I could never look on that face again for all the wealth of the States. You're a foolish child. The man may be as ugly as the devil, but if his heart is good, he's worth all the perfumed puppies that walk them out. Oh, Uncle, he is hideous. Do you remember that old wooden figure in the church of St. Lawrence? When I was a child and we went to Rotterdam, and I was so afraid of that face I could not take my eyes from it. It was really him. Did you see his hands? Well, be quiet. I've signed the contract. I have no sentimental scenes to describe, no exquisite details of the cruelty of a guardian, no agonies or transports of lovers. The record I have to make is one of heartlessness. Nothing more. The contract was signed and settlements made even more splendid than Dow ever dreamed of. Godfrey, it must be soon. We have less than a week. Soon? There is nowhere in light and they would know where to find us. Perhaps it will not happen. You have seen the contract. My uncle will keep faith. Well, then it will be his doing. I have nothing to keep us. You will not let me go to that creature. I will work, Rose. In the future I will buy back the contract. I'll buy it back double. And so the wedding day dawned, and Godfrey Chalcon saw the prize carried off by his monstrous rival. three days, Shalcon absented himself from the school. Then he returned to work, if with less cheerfulness, with far more dogged resolution than before. And bit by bit, the impulse of love gave place to that of ambition. Months passed, and contrary to expectation and agreement, Garrett Dow heard nothing of his niece or her worshipful husband. He had grown so uneasy that he sent Shalcon to journey to Rotterdam and to satisfy himself as to the comfort and safety of Rose. Shalcon had left not a house in the Boomkey untried, but no one had ever heard of the rich Minya Vanderhausen. Eventually, he tired of what now seemed an impossible commission. Now, you need not pledge yourself unnecessarily, mine hair, but you will do so when you find it is necessary. Henrike.
стой. One carriage is much like another, and yet, even in the darkness, this one, most strangely encountered outside the church of St. Lawrence itself, recalled for Shalcombe the fateful morning when Rose had left her home forever. Did you carry a wedding party from the home of Gerrit Dow in Leiden? Yes, my man. In the early summer. And after the ceremony? The old man came out and took a carriage back to Leiden. I waited an hour and... No one else left the church. Uh, the light was fading, mist coming down. So I went into the church to find them. There was no one inside. No one? When I came back out to the carriage, I looked inside. I found this on the seat. With enough silver in it to pay for the fare ten times over. And you had no impression where they might have gone? None, sir. I've never seen him since. Can I carry you somewhere, sir? No. I will walk. I have myself seen this curious little painting. It has already passed through several private hands. Like other small canvases by Schalken, it seems to draw upon elements of a peculiarly personal nature, and yet with no apparent foundation in what we know of the life of the painter. In all the paintings I've seen, I've remarked a strange distance in the relationship of the human figures therein. Contacts made only perhaps by the expected conventions and courtesies of polite society or by commercial transaction. Sensuality without warmth, without passion. Trappings that are ornate and lovely and yet set in a darkness that the faltering lamplight or candle flame never seems capable of penetrating. Vandenberg, 180 gilded. The vanishing of Rose Elderkaust those many years ago was a continuing grief to the aged Dow. He felt most strongly that it had been defrauded, and he did not know why. In order to dispel his loneliness, for he could no longer work, he continued to keep close company with his now famous pupil. 
Van Bolger. Mm. Van Bolger. 120 guilders. 120 guilders. They ask for the work of Gerrit Dowell and they pay 120 guilders. More than they pay for mine. Rightly so. It's a matter of reputation and experience. I'm known in England now. They should pay more. Save me, never leave me alone, not for a moment. He is here. Best to the wakeful, sleep to the sleepwalkers. Oh, it is dark. The darkness is unsafe. Bring light. Bring light.
What is it? It is Lesbia, weighing in the balance, her jewellery against her pet sparrow. What's it mean? It's only a story. May I suggest a new introduction, which I am convinced will please my hair? No, Hendrika. I would like you only to see the new girl, a lovely unspoiled creature whose family have regrettably fallen on hard times, and to whom I have promised I will introduce only the most cultivated of our visitors. Hendrika. Very good, my hair. So fond of you, my hair, our Hendrika. And perhaps next time you will meet the lovely Rose from Rotterdam. Madame, the new girl. Ah, uh -huh. I knew my hair could not resist. Rose? Dame in here. Mary Magdalene. She's in the Bible. artist Pygmalion, when he saw how the women around him seemed to be made of stone, hard like flint, determined he would fashion for himself a statue lovelier than any woman born. He stood at the altar at the feast of Venus praying, I ask for, he didn't dare to say the ivory maiden, one like the ivory maiden. And when he returned, he went straight to the statue. She seemed warm. The ivory lost its hardness as he touched her breast with his fingers. Mary Magdalene. Pandora. Who's serious? The face of the artist here becomes the gloating satyr who spies on beauty but does not possess it. The classical and mythological subjects in which Shalkin at this time indulged himself and I presume his rich patrons seem to me characterized by mawkish sentiments or a calculated eroticism that often verges on the absurd. And yet, at the same time, and perhaps privately, he created a series of female figures by lamp and candlelight who confront the viewer in a direct, sometimes coquettish attitude of invitation, perhaps even of challenge.
I have never before fully understood this obsession until I became acquainted with the narrative I am now passing on to you. In his late thirties, Schalken married a girl from a rich merchant's family. Her name was Francoise Van Diemen de Breda. She was several years his junior. Although her social position did not perhaps fully realise Schalken's expectations, by now his own reputation was considerable, still, she was a reasonable match, not untutored in the manners of polite society and adequately trained in the household arts. Yes. Do I have the honour to address Godfrey Schalken? Yes, Mynheer. I am Schalken. It is a great pleasure, Godfrey Schalken. I have seen your work in the house of the Burgermeister of Rotterdam. I compliment you upon it. I have come to ask if you will paint a portrait of my daughter. I had conceived it with my daughter at play on the eve of her birthday before entering into womanhood. A pleasing background, perhaps my own drawing room, and in the foreground, her favourite doll. Doll? She is very attached to the doll. I no longer paint portraits to commission, sir. Perhaps in the future, but I have work on another theme at present, one of my own. I know it, sir. I shall be honoured to speak with you about it. I have seen few more haunting scenes outside the work of Rembrandt van Ryan and Gerrit Dow. Dow no longer paints. You were his pupil. I'm my own man, mynheer. I do not copy Dow, nor do I paint portraits to order. <laughs> you need not pledge yourself unnecessarily, Godfrey Chalken. But when you see the value of my commission, I think you will find it is necessary. Schalken. Gottfried Schalken. Gerrit Dow later faded into obscurity under the shadow of his more famous pupil. Gerrit Dow had died in 1675. Schalken went alone to the funeral, which in spite of Dow's celebrity was not well attended. He returned from the Church of St. Lawrence far later than expected that night, 
and with a demeanour that seemed to reflect some inexpressible anguish. Spoke not a single word to his household, but went straightway to his studio, where he remained until the morning. It was only years later that Shalcon first spoke of the events of that night. He'd been left alone in the Church of St. Lawrence after the funeral party had dispersed. As he walked quietly, alone with his thoughts in the darkened building, he'd been overtaken by the drowsiness of intense cold in that vast and empty chapel of stone. Some impulse, stronger than mere curiosity, led him to the door of the church vault.
To his dying day, Schalken was convinced of the reality of the vision he had witnessed, and he left behind this picture as testimony to it. But look more closely, and remember his last terrible meeting with Rose Velderkast. If you recall, the painter had fainted dead away at whatever apparition she had presented to him. Here he has painted the observer, himself, in the act of drawing his sword, as if to defend himself against the powers that were threatening him. A self-portrait, perhaps? Perhaps also a little self-deception. Gottfried Schalken went to his grave in November 1706. And apart from the story I have told you, which was passed down through the mouths of my father and his father's father, there is no other record of this mysterious romance in the life of Schalken the painter. <laughs>